Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing, one of the pastors on staff. I usually reside on the Erie campus. We have another friend in the booth today. He's on staff. That's how he introduces himself every week. Thomas Milburn. Do you not? You don't like that I do that? I think it's funny. I just think I say, it's hey, funny. I'm, hey, my name's Thomas. I'm on staff here at the church. Yeah. I think it's, it's fine. I you know what I've th- noticed is... Zach and Tom have been doing that for some time, too. Have you Tom, noticed that? Tom was here. Last time he was here, yeah. he introduced himself that way. And, I, and he smirked, <laughs> and no one else caught it. I think he looked right at me and was <laughs> making fun of me. But. He smirked. He smirked. Like, you could see it in his face. Like, was like <laughs> oh, that was hilarious. I do. I will say, though, like, there are some times, and like a memorial service yeah. is one of them. Yes. You, you definitely introduce yourself as the pastor. Yes. I, I can't wait for the day when you come up to the stage and say, I'm going to introduce myself as Tom because you love, <laughs> that's your preferred, preferred way of your name, right? <laughs> that is. There's so many things that just went through my head. I'm so <laughs> glad the Holy, the the Holy Spirit has a filter. Um, you know, so here's the thing. So out before working at Calvary, I would be known as Tom. Yeah. It was, it's confusing. When the senior guy, <laughs> and you, the man, Tom Shirk, uh, also goes by Tom. Yeah, because right. he doesn't need my emails or voicemails. <laughs> Nor does, yeah, you want his. Yeah, I don't want his either. <laughs> no, I don't want his at all. Yeah, no. So. All right, I got to really most people don't know that, like, your full name is Jason, and you go by Jay. <laughs> <laughs> that is not true, actually. <laughs> Not true at all. My mom would be appalled. She, she's the one who <laughs> named me. And she listens. She, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Mama. <laughs> sorry, Mama J. Okay, hey. Yeah. Question for you, a real serious question. Have you had something this fall that's pumpkin flavored yet? No. Really? Is it fall yet? I don't even know if it is fall. When is the first day of fall? Oh, uh, sometime later. That's hilarious, but you've not had anything pumpkin-y yet. No, what have you... Yesterday. Oh, so yes, yesterday was the start of it. The, yesterday, I had pumpkin bread, and I was like, it just hit me, that taste of like, it's like cinnamon, pumpkin, there's another flavor in there, and you're just like, oh, I guess it's fall now, because I'm eating pumpkin. Fall officially begins Thursday, uh, September 22nd. What? We are on... Point. That makes sense because it's like 96 degrees today. Yes. And then tomorrow will be 60. Is it supposed to rain tomorrow? I think so. Oh, I love that. So. Hey, I know you don't listen, people, to the Calvary Bible <laughs> podcast for <laughs> pumpkin updates. But, hey, you can go to calvarybible.com, find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. We love that you're connecting with us. You can always write us at the weekly at calvarybible.com. Thomas still wants to know your favorite movies of all time. So you can write us at the weekly at calvarybible.com. Thomas and I both get those emails. We would love to see what's your favorite movie of all time. So you would, you would actually have to sit down in front of a computer or on your phone. Yes. And send an email to, to the weekly. The weekly. At calvarybible.com. And then list your three top movies. Yes. Or if you want to know what's happening at Calvary, you can go to calvarybible.com and click your campus. Go to events page. We have some great events happening this fall. We want you to get connected. One of those I want to highlight is the one that you and I will both be at, Lord willing. It's the men's retreat happening in BV, October 21st through the 23rd. If you're a guy, we would love to have you there. We are over half full on our way to almost having 50 spots left within the week. So you need to go to calvarybible.com slash events, sign up for men's retreat today. Is the men's retreat the next thing or is, are we doing kickoff and we're doing kickoff cookoff yeah, on what, this campus? What's the, what's the date on the chili? October, October 6th, October 6th on but, the Erie campus on the Erie campus. Okay. So if you attend the Boulder campus regularly yes. or Thornton or Thornton and would like to eat some chili, <laughs> <laughs> I like how you invited you. You are more than welcome to join us October 6th for the, Kickoff and cook off. Yes. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. There's 30 entries. No, there's going to be over 30 entries. Over 30 entries of chili. Yes. And the top 
chili prize for the night for the best chili in the room gets a Russell Wilson jersey. Oh, man. A Broncos Russell Wilson, not a Seahawks <laughs> one. Yeah, not Seahawks. <laughs> Is It'd be it, funny, the worst chili could get a Seahawks jersey. <laughs> what funny. if we told him, it's a signed Russell Wilson jersey, and then I signed the Seattle Seahawks <laughs> Russell Wilson jersey. <laughs> there you go. There you go. But we're looking forward to that event as well, if you're on the area campus. And if you're on the other campuses, come over for the night. And if you want some chili. And let us know that you're listening to the weekly. Yeah, it's going to be good. All right, enough pumpkin, enough weekly. I have a really serious theological question for you, Thomas. I doubt it, but go ahead. Was Peter rich? Ooh. As you looked at la- last week, Luke 5. Yeah. The fishermen, Peter on the boat. You went to John 21 and talked about him once again on the boat. Was Peter rich? Well, have you seen The Chosen, the mo- the show? Yes. They don't think he's rich. Well, yeah, what are your, I, what are, you know, I'm sure the weekly wants to actually hear your thoughts on The Chosen. I'm sure they don't, but uh, that's an interesting show. We, we, it was interesting because a few people, the only reason I mentioned that is a few people came up, and I think The Chosen for many people has been so vivid, yes. I guess, as, as a display of who Jesus is, oh. right? Like someone has put an imagination to some of these stories that they actually thought, Peter, the reason he didn't catch any fish was because he's bankrupt and he owes Matthew taxes. And oh yeah, it, I and guess like, that oh yeah, that's sense. the storyline. I forgot about that. Yeah, it is a storyline. Not exactly in the Bible, but I'm definitely not <laughs> in the Bible. Read your Bible. Yeah, but that was that was interesting. Um, yeah. I don't assume so. Oh, that's interesting. Though he has a house, mm-hmm. right? So he's not. We, I would. I wouldn't put him in the category of poverty by any means. Right. He has a house. He's able to take in his mother-in-law. Yep. Right? So that's a deal. Um, and he's able to be gone from home and be on these journeys, probably still caring for his wife if she's not on the journey too. Totally. Without fishing. Without fishing over several decades, possibly. In his Potentially. Ministry. Potentially, depending on where you have them. Yeah. And what her, her, her involvement in their ministry in, was. Yeah. yeah. But... Uh, she probably was some of the other women. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, if there's, you, a, there's a lot of ladies that were following Jesus. Yeah, totally. And really supporting, really doing some heavy lifting in ministry yeah. in and the first century. They're the only ones that actually stayed till the end. You know, it's <laughs> yeah, totally. like the Gospels make such a good point of like, anyway, all the dudes <laughs> bailed, out. bailed and the mighty courageous women of faith. Stood at the foot of the cross, no doubt. Man, that's beautiful. that's good stuff. Yeah. But uh, no, do you think he's rich, or why do you think he's rich? Yeah, I can I can sense I can sense in you. It. This is why you have to love church history, because you could go to Capernaum today. They have a church over the site of the possible Peter House. Capernaum and it's a nice house mm. for a first century yeah now is it a hundred percent true no could I mean could it be it's the probability is higher than over 70 percent probably for me going over 70 for that being Peter's first century house okay. historically it's said to be and it was big and you make a really good point that he does leave everything in the text that says what it says, right? Mm-hmm. To follow Jesus. And then he ends up blessing the church with having a church in his house and being able to do ministry and feeding his family still. Maybe he sold all the fish from the catch <laughs> and got a lot of money. Or his... his yeah, his cousin did and said, "Here, Peter, here's your, yeah. here's your half." Yeah, no, you know, it just it's interesting when you think about like church history is really important. Church archaeology is really important too. I've said that on this podcast. It's not a nerd thing; it's a sort of reality. It helps give mm-hmm. vibrant questions and ponderings to your faith. Anyways, that's good. It, I mean, I think the big thing is when when he walks away from fishing yeah that's that's a big deal 
That is, you're wa- he's walking away from a commercial enterprise that feeds his family. And it seems like other men are connected to him at being the boss yeah. of that fishing enterprise. Right, so he's not out there fishing by himself. Even this no. great catch, he can't do it by himself. Yeah, And, you know, James and John and Andrew are with them, and they go, but not everybody. Not everyone, yeah. So, and yeah, you, it's a deal. You know, and maybe it's actually the enterprise of fishing that supports him in his ministry later where they – know that he's walked away some of them but they all are believers now so they just make sure they're taken care of Mm -hmm. it could have been that too we just don't know one thing that tom pointed out in his message on sunday on the border campus which was so good two things i'll I'll mention two things one specifically about peter he he mentions this like so here's peter sees this miraculous catch and the american spirit would would probably be hey jesus I see what you did here. This this could be very profitable for me. Why don't you join my fishing company? Yeah. And let's see if we can do that some more. And it's just talking about the American spirit of, I can I see Jesus' value mm-hmm. as it benefits my life. That's really so why good. don't you join me in what I'm doing? It's like you're putting him in your pocket almost. Yeah. To continue to perform the way that you, you saw him perform to your benefit, as opposed to what Peter sees is, the miraculous catch, and it's, oh my goodness, I see who Jesus is, the, the one yeah. who controls the fish, this is God, and then on his face in fear. And just think, man, which which one am, he, am, am yeah. I? Like, Am I the one that adds Jesus to the thing I got going on? Or am I the one that surrenders everything and, and in fear says, I'm not worthy to be in your presence? Yeah. That's the first thing you took away from Thompson. What's the second thing? second one was about Levi and just the difference between like Peter can go back to fishing. In, in fact, here on the Erie campus, we talked about a return to fishing Yeah. Um, after the resurrection. But Levi cannot return back to his business mm-hmm. because he leaves it and there's no way Rome is ever going to rehire him yep. to do anything. So he, he actually leaves everything behind and cannot return. It's like this. They burn the ships. Yeah, totally. And we are with Jesus. And the old life is is done. Which is a beautiful, we're going to talk about like the really practical implication of those two stories right now. Is that Jesus costs you everything, but he costs us everything in different ways. So he costs you everything in a certain way in your life, and he costs me everything in a certain way in my life. Sometimes each of us are going to be, our costs are going to be different. So like you can't, it's not like one size fits all Christianity. It's like, it's going to cost you something that's embarrassing, hard. You have to live into the rest of your life. And that is your story with Jesus. My story is it's going to cost me something else. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And, and we see that with the disciples from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if that's part of their argument about who's the greatest. Oh, yeah. That's they're like, man, what did it cost you to get that's here? That's a really good. That's yeah, a like, What did it cost question. you to get here? Well, yeah. How long you've been following? Yeah. I had to leave everything. You yeah. still got a fishing business. You yeah. still wear your logo, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. Yeah. I wonder, like, everyone brings, like, talents to the table. I'm sure traveling around, yeah. it's helpful to be able to fish. I'm sure I wonder what, what Levi brought to the table. Totally. Maybe the bank accounts. Well, Judas is in charge of the bank accounts. He's not allowed oh. to be. He's got sticky fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting. It, it reminds me once again, it reminds me that this is actually in history. Yeah, it's and, so, yeah. And we're just reading episodes. We're not reading actually day-to-day living. Like, there's no, we don't get the conversations like, Peter has to use a rock one night for a pillow and has a crooked neck for two days, <laughs> and they're all making fun of him. You know what I mean? Like, we don't get those stories. Yeah. Yeah. That Yeah, that wasn't the intention, but gosh. I hope that when we are all <laughs> yeah, totally. with the Jesus, we get to hear some more of these stories. Yeah, we do. Yeah. But okay, so I got another question about Peter. Okay. He's out fishing. He does this thing. You you make a really good point. I think I, I haven't heard anyone say this in a long time. I was super thankful for that. Is like they're putting away their nets for the day, right? These guys seem to be on the margin of 
one catch from another catch at times. So maybe Peter's rich, but also rich in that culture is like, you know, he actually can have food for seven days. So he's rich instead of food for one. How does it, how was your reflection on when Jesus is choosing these men? Like why the, why these guys? Like, do you have some suspicions? Like, why these guys to be disciples as you're like starting to process really the text and these stories and these men and these conversations with Jesus? Man, it's a good question. I, I think there's not enough known about the whole kind of tribe mm-hmm. in my mind. There's not enough known about them to try to draw any sort of conclusions of like, are they from the 12 tribes? Do they represent, I mean, like metaphorically, obviously. Yeah. Um, but what is their unique background that tries to color that in. You don't know a lot about really seven of them besides name, you know. Um, why these guys? I think it goes back to Jesus is praying all night, at least in Luke's account. Yeah. Right? So he's been praying before he calls them. Um, when you put the synoptics together, there might be a little bit of a sequential difference as far as the activities of Jesus in between calling these disciples. I'm glad you said that. Um, it's a textual... Yeah. And here's just a principle, like just for anyone who's actually listening and comes to Calvary on Sunday. When we do these studies, I try to the best of my ability to preach from the gospel of Luke as Luke intended a message to be given Mm -hmm. and anticipated for an audience to be receiving it without the knowledge of Matthew, Mark, John, epistles, church history, which is good. It's, It's fun to color in things, but it's like if you only had Luke's story, What's Luke trying to portray here? Which is different than Matthew and Mark and John. Right. And so let's just stay in the the Luke account. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, so the Lord's praying. And I think it relates to these attributes, right? Like, it's just incredible that, G- that Peter takes Jesus at his word. Mm-hmm. He recognizes who Jesus is. He's willing to surrender it all. Um, I think that those are the attributes that he's looking for. Yeah. But I don't know. Sons of Thunder? Like... Come on now, Jesus. Yeah. That's a good pick. <laughs> it's like, all right, early draft pick. Yeah, early, definitely. Right? Yeah, late in the draft. Yeah. We'll take Judas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I, I would say it is representative of like all people. Mm-hmm. Um, then you I mean, you add that. I mean, Luke's going to get to that in just a chapter about the women who are following Jesus by name. Right. And so yeah, there are men and there are women. There's 12. There's more than 12. There's 72. There's more than 72. So... There's a lot of different kinds of groups that are following. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure why these are the 12. How important is it to, for us to remember that Jesus was praying all night before he picks them? I think it's just a formational practice for us, man. Like, How many times before a big decision am I carving out space? And I don't know if I'm the one speaking or if I should be the one listening, mm-hmm. but there is an intentional prayer life. It's kind of embarrassing, yeah. you know, to right. make to think about some of the decisions I've made without even consulting the Lord. Yeah. So I think it's a big deal that I would say, hey, there's a pattern of Jesus' life. Um, you actually see that pattern continued into the book of Acts. So remember Luke's two part series. And the church gathers to pray before they make selections. Mm-hmm. So before replacing Judas, they're praying. And I just think that. That's the pattern I think Jesus modeled for them that they continued as the leaders of the church. Yeah. I don't know. What 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 was in your mind? No, I think you're right on. I think it's a really good formation practice for us to remember. Even the son of God, who's fully connected to God and God's, the father's will, spends the night before praying who should be his disciples Mm -hmm. and making sure and confirming and prepping his own trajectory with these men that he has to do it. So we probably should do it. <laughs> <laughs> if Jesus be, did it, we should probably do it. Yeah. And you know, that's just a really good practical step of like big decision in your life. Pray big decision in your life. Probably pray through the night occasionally, you know, with these things that prayer was, the mechanism in which God, the uh, Jesus talked to the Father, and the Father talked to Jesus. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I don't know if it's the idea that Jesus didn't know who he was going to choose. I, I, yeah, I, I would say probably not. Like, he knows. Right. Yeah. But it's, I would think when I look at Luke, like all the the kingdom battles that are going on between the the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the devil. Yeah. Like, there's probably something going on there where Jesus is wrestling it out, being connected to the Father. Yep. Before drawing these guys to himself. Yeah, totally. But. Super interesting. I think, you know, you're saying you, I love it that you're intentional about staying in Luke, right? It's hard to do sometimes. Oh, I'm, you I'm wanna, sure you just drive you nuts at times. You're like, why am I limiting there's myself? some other details. Um, and, you know, occasionally it's possible. But you got to think, like, you know, there's a very specific reason Luke is choosing this and not that or abbreviating this and not that. Yeah. And if we would just look at the way that he presents the story and not get bogged down with, well, these are the missing details um, or there's extra details or, you know, whatever, just say, what was the point of Luke's communicating this story this yeah. way? An orderly account for yeah. Theophilus to understand. Yeah. So let's what just is, stay there. Yeah, totally. That's right. And we'll get that right? with the Beatitudes. Like, okay, it seems like he hasn't abbreviated. Here's a question for you. Coming yeah. to the Beatitudes. Oh, man, that's... This is where I want to jump ship is, to the harmonies of the gospel. I'm sure. I so, still want to jump. Is this the same sermon, one on the mount, one on the plains? Mm-hmm. Or did Jesus preach the sermon more than once? Actually, this what, is Jay's thought? opinion. Jay's so opinion. Jay's opinion. I've read the arguments. I think it's the same sermon. It's two different perspectives. Matthew says we're on a mount. Luke says we're on a mount, but it's a flat spot. <laughs> On the mount. Now, I think we get more in Luke, more in the Matthew, because the harmonies tell you that. Because he just called Matthew Levi to come follow him, so he is intrinsically paying more attention to actually what the sermon has to say. Luke is catching up in his interviews what Jesus said in the sermon. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Two different perspectives, same sermon. I mean, Luke might be interviewing Peter here. He might be interviewing the Sons of Thunder, and they're like, he said whoa, didn't he? Yeah, Yeah. he said whoa. There were some woes in there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And Matthew's like, I'm a new believer. I'm paying attention. I'm writing this down. I know what he said in an orderly way. So the harmonies of the gospel sort of help you, me, let me say genuine, think this way Mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah i think it's fascinating though because if you compare matthew and luke's sermon on the mount they are different if you compare matthew and luke's sermon on the mount they are similar and i think that's a beautiful thing we get a robust and maybe it's a two-part sermon maybe matthew's like okay jesus is done and then luke's like wait a minute you forgot to tell about this little middle section, you know what I mean? Who knows? Mm-hmm. Who knows? I know this for fact, though. I can tell you this is 100% true. What you get in Luke is what you need. What you get in Matthew is what you need. That's good. Yeah. I think for any listeners who are out there thinking, wait a minute, the sermon, what do you mean by the sermons are different? Um, it'd be good to know there's not a contradiction. Not a different, yep. It's actually incredible to see the similarities of the sermons. Yeah. Since one person was an eyewitness and another person is just recording what eyewitnesses said. Yep. And when you talk to people who are doing investigations, whether that be for law enforcement or reporting, journalism, when when you're interviewing two different people and they're saying the exact same thing, you're thinking corroboration. Yeah. Um, that's actually a less trustworthy Oh, that's a really good witness. Yeah, and so you would expect that. that they would have varying details based on who they are, what they saw, what they retained um, without contradiction. So yeah. witnesses fill in what happened. Yeah. I, when I say differences, let me clarify that. Yeah. Matthew has a spiritual emphasis on the sermon. Like there's a spiritual poverty. There's a spiritual hunger. There's a spiritual thing going on. Luke is very linear and saying there's a physical hunger, physical need, physical reality of the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a take on both of their personalities possibly. Matthew's trying to show, if I'm going to conjecture, 
the new Moses, a new Moses laying down the law. Here's another thing. And Luke is like, this is just what Jesus said. Does that make sense? Here's another thing I thought was really interesting is the comparison between Jesus and Moses and the sermon. Moses had to go up to the mountain to receive from God what God wanted from his people. Jesus goes up the mountain and tells them what God wants. Yeah. And it shows you two different types of authority. Does that make sense? Oh, we saw that in our story this week, less highlighted in Erie for sure. But when he's he's pulling out Peter, this is chapter 5, where, he, where it says, on one occasion while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. Yeah. And we talk about you know Jesus giving the word of God. Instead of receiving it and disseminating it. Yeah, it's not as though like... Jesus is not holding a Bible or unrolling a scroll right. and then reading. Like Jesus is just speaking, and people say, that's the words of God. That's right. what it is, is. Jesus is speaking the words of God, meaning he's God, and the words that he speaks are God's word. Mm-hmm. And and, it's, and that's just, yeah, like you're saying, fundamentally different. Yeah, and you're right. The, this is great. This is why we're in Luke. It's because we're trusting Luke wants you to he wants we need to settle into his part of the story and just receive what he wants us to know we can we can go back to matthew receive what he wants us to know eventually as well but this is the beautiful thing about staying in that text is that we just get to receive it Mm -hmm. like okay what how are we gonna live now how then shall we live thanks francis schaefer (laughs) thank you but that i mean that's one of the things you've been sharing with people about your excitement for luke it's like, how are you approaching Sunday mornings? So we're asking people, just read the chapter that we're in, and then we'll select, select one of those episodes. So we're going to be in chapter 6 this coming Sunday. Yeah. When you're reading chapter 6, what are you thinking about? How are you approaching Sunday morning? You know, Calvary does a great job of preaching sort of like the th- big theological things we need to know. Sometimes like the doctrine of, you know, we went through Romans, and we learned the sufficiency of Jesus Christ in his ministry for our salvation, right? We and Luke can take that the same way and just think about the theological implications Jesus had. What I've been doing with Luke is really asking the question, what did Jesus say and how can I live that out? What does he want me to do with this in the way in which my Bible has black and red letters? So really slowing down, what did Jesus say? And what is the real implication for my like daily life in that, that conversation? Yeah. So I've been reading in such a way as that Jesus is directly telling me things that I need to understand, live into, realities I need to believe, ways in which I need to walk out my faith and fear and tremble. Instead of just saying Luke 6 is about Jesus is a, authority and him disseminating some law to the Lord. You know what I mean? Like there's a different, both are good. Both are functional. Both are really spiritual implication. Both can be devotional. So I'm not saying one's devotional. One's not one's leads to worship. One's not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, I really am trying to understand what is Jesus saying and how can that actually influence me? And part of that is the Christian imagination. This is why I love the chosen because the chosen teaches you, teaches me, that there was a story involved in this. And we only get sections of that story. Mm-hmm. And that it's okay to read the text and wonder, I wonder if it was sunny that day. I wonder what Jesus ate. You know, like, how did Levi just come from being saved to writing down the sermon? Like, these are really good things to think about. Way better than if the Broncos are going to win this season or not. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So no, I think I mean that's that would be my hope for all of us. I think you're right on the right track. I want to follow you in that. Is we want to be disciples. Yeah. Like Christians know what Jesus said. Christians do know what Jesus said. Disciples follow what Jesus said. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's a lot harder. It is a lot harder, but that's like that was the commissioning. Right. Is Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, follow, do, practice 
all that I have commanded. Right. So it's like you have to you do have to know it first. Yeah, you do. Absolutely. But then to know it, to apply it, to know it, to practice it is a different approach of of the person on Sunday morning. And I, I say, man, we all want to be the people on Sunday morning that come and say, All right, show me what Jesus said and did so that I know what I might do. Right. I mean, yeah. How do I practice what he did? Yeah, and it's in even that even that sometimes has a because tr- you're like it's a checkbox of what he did, and I can do those things. Yeah. Dude. It's more of like, what did he, what was the reality in which he lived that I want to, re- reality I want to live in? That's good, because that's, that's beyond the WWJD bracelet. Right. We've done right. that. We can all be good Christians. Yeah. And do what Jesus did. It's the belief that actually you believe that you have a father in heaven who has full authority, who you want to live out his will, and these are ways in which you can bless those who curse you. Mm-hmm. These are ways in which you can um, take the log out of your own eye, the speck in your brother's eye. You know, that's a different mm-hmm. level of heart that I just want, you know, I don't, I don't want to miss Jesus in studying Luke. And I think you can miss Jesus in studying Luke sometimes. Oh, for sure. I think that's, I mean, that's the end of the chapter this next week. Right. Is Jesus saying, you know, build your life on me. Yeah. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you don't do anything that I tell you to do. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't say build my life upon the things I do. Yeah, he says build the life upon me, me. So it's a relational, yeah, movement. And you know, I'm I only am heightened to that because I probably have lived too many years of WWJD instead of actually living in Christ, and just prone to knowing my, you know, performance. Mm-hmm. So that's all. It's all performance based. For, for me, it is usually. <laughs> you know, some people have fear based. They move in fear. Some people perform. Some people do it in shame. Whatever it is, but for me, I just want to encounter Jesus. I just want to encounter Jesus. I just want to know what His voice sounds like. And I think you can. I think you genuinely can if you give yourself to these stories, to these conversations, to these places, these narratives that we're studying. I think it's a wonderful thing. I don't know how we could devote our time in any better way than to get around the life of Jesus. Oh man. And just see what he did, see what he said, see where he went, who did he who did he get alongside? How did he call him? And let that just be formational for us. Yeah. Who that's why we're in Luke, right? And that's why we're taking so long through Luke yeah, all the way to Easter. Be good. Just just imagine like what God might do in me work out of me, work mm-hmm. into me, if I continue to just sit before him in the Gospel of Luke for the next 20 weeks. Yeah, and that's the beautiful thing, and that's the hard thing, and that's why we're here to do it together. That's why we need community. That's why you need a good local church. Hey, Calvary, we're so thankful for the conversation today. Thank for your genuineness towards us, listening every week, being interested in what we have to say. We love you. We're so thankful for you. We'd love to hear from you. You can always write us at theweekly at calvarybible.com. In the meantime, you could be reading Luke 6. That's the next. We're moving on. Luke 6 this week, Luke 7 next week. And uh, we love that you're journeying with us. All right. Have a great day.